Welcome, everyone. I am Matt Rutherford, Curator of Genealogy and Local History at the Newberry Library. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Author program with Francesca Morgan for her new book, A Nation of Descendants, Politics and the Practice of Genealogy in U.S. History. The Newberry Library supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. Since our founding in 1887, the Newberry has remained dedicated to deepening our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us. We connect researchers and visitors with our collection in the Newberry's reading rooms, exhibition galleries, program spaces, classrooms, and online digital resources. The Newberry reading rooms and exhibition galleries are open to readers Tuesday through Saturday. Our Rosenberg Bookshop is open Wednesday through Saturday, and you can shop online at any time. You can purchase a nation of descendants there. Visit Newberry.org to learn more about our collections and exhibitions, our many digital resources, online classes, and our virtual and in-public public programs, in-person public programs. I also encourage you to follow the Newberry on social media for more opportunities to engage with our collections, our staff, and stories that bridge the past and present. During the program, please enter questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. As time permits, our speakers will respond. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Francesca Morgan, Associate Professor of History at Northeastern Uni Illinois University in Chicago, and author of Women and Patriotism in Jim Crow America. She is also a scholar in residence at the Newberry Library and did much for, of her extensive research for a nation of descendants here. So it's great to see you, Francesca. Welcome. You too, Matt. Thank you. And congratulations on publishing such a marvelous work. Oh, I have it here you. in front of me. Wow. Uh, it's Thank really. You, I do too. <laughs> That's great. Uh, it's fascinating the way you've laid out the history of, of genealogy in America. It truly is. Thank you. Uh, your book covers a lot of ground and a broad chronological scope, really from the 18th uh, to, to, uh, through the 21st centuries to today. Uh, and there are many, many directions we can go. But, but to start off, let's start at the top. Um, your subtitle is The Politics and Practice of Genealogy in U.S. History. And as genealogists and in genealogy in general, we tend to talk a lot about the practice of genealogy to the point that most of us don't even consider any of its other aspects. But the fascinating lens that you introduce is politics. So can you talk a little bit about what you mean by the politics of genealogy? How has genealogy been political? Well, thanks, Matt. I appreciate the question. Um, when I use the term politics, I mean politics in its broadest sense. Our term politics comes from the term foreign power relations. I mean, social hierarchies of all kind. And I also take into account um, institutions of government. And I'm gonna get even broader. Um, a big point of mine is uh, genealogy expressing group identity. It may seem very personal. It may seem about particular individuals, families, surnames but there are all kinds of ways that it reinforces and perpetuates and even creates all kinds of other social hierarchies and challenges them too. We've seen it be an instrument of white supremacy, if you will, and that's complicated in itself. We've also seen it uh, express the uh, freedom struggles and the push for civil rights. And I could go on, but um, I will um, welcome Matt's next question to make the most of our time. Well, absolutely, and that that um, you know you spend quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of the thrust of the book is exactly about these hierarchies, and and they're really fascinating. And it you you really show us that there are many twists and turns uh, in the history of genealogy, and many inflection points. And one big one that that I really want to talk about, and that I think is likely familiar to to our audience, uh, Alex Haley's roots is seen by many uh, as a, a seminal point in the practice of American genealogy. Uh, your book argues that it both transformed genealogy practice and also perpetuated some of these hierarchies that you just, you just alluded to that have been present uh, throughout American history. 
So can you spend a minute and describe Roots and some of the changes that it wrought? Absolutely. Um, let me give uh, you all a quick overview that will, for some of you, serve as a reminder. Um, Alex Haley was already famous as the author of the autobiography of Malcolm X uh, when he published uh, the book Roots in late 1976, after about four years of many articles and talks. Um, in a nutshell, um, Roots is his account of seven generations of his mother's ancestry going back to an enslaved ancestor, an enslaved forefather uh, who had known Africa, uh, what is today the nation of Gambia, um, excuse me, acknowledging the, the Mandinka tribe. And uh, so uh, the story starts with Kunta Kinte, um, childhood and youth in Africa, and um, extends to his enslaved descendants in um, British America and then in the USA and goes on to discuss emancipated ancestors. And this is a story where the principal characters um, and heroes, this is a story of heroes and villains and the heroes here are African-American. And four months after this best-selling book came out, uh, Alex Haley called it a saga you know, an adventure story. Um, we have the uh, eight part, uh, I'm gonna call it a mini series, even though at the time we didn't use the word mini series, it showed for eight nights on network TV, uh, lengthy episodes. And uh, the final episode had viewer statistics. I, I, I looked up the more recent sort of Super Bowl statistics just to kind of compare the numbers I was dealing with in the 1970s and um, 130 million just in the USA watching this final episode. And I've also talked to folks who were born long after that night in January, 1977, born 10, 20 years later, who caught up with Roots on um, DVD and I'm sure it's streaming. And I understand the History Channel's done a reboot of uh, Roots in 2016, but that's basically what it is. And what does it have to do with the history of genealogy? Well, this is the first big entertainment and um, I'm, here I'm referring to both the book and the TV show where genealogy is uh, such a part of the plot. I should say big mass entertainment. I can point to books before Roots, of course, but uh, it's the first sort of mass entertainment where we see that. So it's a thrilling antecedent to all those genealogy reality shows that we've had in um, the last few decades. And um, there are all things, sorts of things Alex Haley said about the individual and their emotions uh, when it comes to discovering ancestry that uh, were absolutely inspirational to all those uh, subsequent businesses. I do a lot with business history um, in this book. So think about business and entertainment um, and so forth. Now, um, what could this story of roots have to do uh, with the politics of genealogy in the sense of the social hierarchies that I just referred to? Um, well, uh, to, to make a long story short, Alex Haley, um, this is really complicated in African-American history at this time, 1960s and 70s, but he self-identified as a conservative. He very much adhered, like I say, to um, even when he talked about really big social problems and brutalities on the plantation, and he's very explicit about slavery being, enslavement being a brutal institution. Um, even at the same time, he just had a lot to say about emotions. And um, at least in the 1977 show, he carefully stayed away from times in history that would have overlapped with his audience. He was careful not to point fingers at modern day white people and time and time again. Um, I must say the audience that viewed that final episode, there are all sorts of, um, uh, pardon me, uh, group uh, sort of break, social breakdowns of it. People were curious about just who was watching that night. And it seems like um, there was a slight underrepresentation of African-Americans who made up 12% of the population at that time, 1977 in the USA. 10% of the viewing audience for Roots was African-American at that time. And I'm only taking into account that night. You know, there's so much to say about people who saw it later. But my point being, um, Roots had this way of speaking, well, some would say universally to many people who were not personally um, African-American. And I could have more to say about sort of continuities in the history of genealogy and hierarchies, but I wanna give Matt a chance for a um, follow-up question. 
if he wishes or in the next well, question. Well, sure, absolutely. I mean, it. it I, I'll, you know, just a, a personal note. I mean, uh, Roots was my first introduction to genealogy and I'm not going to give my age away, but I did watch it on TV. So I can, I can speak to what, what a, a profound and, 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 and amazing uh, event it was. And a little bit unlike today when we have so many channels, it was, it was must see TV for sure. Um, and in your book, you, you also talk about, um, and some of the uh, transformative effects in many ways that 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 roots had and certainly it it, uh, it had an, a big effect here at the newberry uh you noted from a study that we had published that almost 60 percent of genealogy patrons at the newberry in 1981 reported having begun their research since roots aired so in that four ish year period um, I also know just from my position, that's when the Newberry really began a, a concerted effort to build our African-American genealogy collection and resources and a, a commitment that uh, and an effort that, that is ongoing that we still continue today, along with many of the other groups that were uh, traditionally excluded uh, from, from genealogy's uh, main, mainstream. Um, I'm going to switch gears just slightly, and because you you talk about this, uh, you, you just sort of alluded to it, but uh, with the uh, entertainment, genealogy is entertainment, and you mentioned that kind of as part and parcel in the book, um, it, along with this other aspect of genealogy's history, which is genealogy for profit and genealogy for hire. So I'm wondering, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, commercialized genealogy, um, past and present, and and um, what does anti-commercial uh, nonprofit genealogy look like too? Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to um, start from early times um, for much of the history of genealogy for hire, and I can confidently begin it in the before the Civil War. In this country, we're talking about one person and two person businesses. We're talking about people who hire themselves out. Um, to uh, perform genealogy research. And there's hierarchies within that. There are people who hire themselves out specifically as record searchers and things like this. Okay, so um, until the 1920s or so, we're talking about, like I say, one person businesses typically selling products such as um, blank uh, chart, the family tree charts and blank forms where you can write down your information and, and things like this. And then we move forward into larger and larger businesses in the 20th century here in Chicago. We have a very interesting German born uh, businessman who worked for who's who, uh, Frederick uh, um, used to be Albert Burkus, but he changed his own name to Frederick Adams Burkus for a reason. Okay, um, he developed the first ever clearing house uh, for genealogy information, which a uh, clearinghouse can be extremely useful if you're you yourself are practicing a genealogist or you know somebody who is right. So he started the first uh, sort of sort of uh, information uh, collection exchange process of its kind. More than fifteen hundred subscribers. Um, after nineteen forty five, we have um, uh, a uh, more Mormon family, the Everton family, out in Logan, Utah who launched um, a periodical, a mass interest periodical, helping more people do more genealogy, they said. The periodical is called the Genealogical Helper. Um, and it endured until the recession year uh, 2009, by which time it was getting some competition, presumably from Ancestry.com and the like. But it's many generations of this family and this periodical in um, popularizing genealogy, making it as sort of easy as possible and as pleasing as possible, fitting um, values and priorities of the descendant was very characteristic of commercial genealogy. And another immediate thing I reach for when I'm trying to represent commercialized genealogy is the traffic in heraldry, if you will. I know traffic is kind of a harsh word. We think of like drug traffickers and stuff, but even to this day, because American law doesn't place any obligations on an act of um, claiming uh, ownership or family ties to a family crest, unlike in Britain, where you, you know, the, the name and the crest pass from individual man to individual man through the generations in the US, we have no such rules. Nothing stopping you to this day from going online and finding a surname um, that 
Oh, I don't know. I don't know if you even have to find it near a family tree that happens to match one of an aristocratic <laughs> family outside the USA. Um, and you can purchase a nice sort of framed version or jewelry or something like this, or there's probably a way you can do this online. Um, okay, so as I have to do with commercialism, once again, it's about uh, pleasing the customer. And I must say, it's about appealing to emotions. People get really emotional about uh, heraldry, for sure, um, in a lot of ways. Okay, what does anti-commercialism look like within? genealogy as businesses expanded and a big pivotal decade for that um, is the 1930s um, as there was uh, an increasing market for um, hobbyists and of course genealogy is both a career and a hobby and stuff okay so 1930s lots of businesses to talk about lots of commercially public public uh, published um, guides to genealogy and instructions to genealogy to talk about lots of scams okay so you have uh, a group of scholarly, a very scholarly people who are all at the 1940 meeting of the American Historical Association who get together and develop the first ever organization of what I'm gonna call professional genealogy. Professional doesn't mean always that you're a career genealogist, but it does mean a particular ethos of um, doing history for its own sake finding all the apples in a client's family tree, even the apples that were rotten. And I'm stealing that metaphor from a real founding figure in professional genealogy. That would be John, Donald Jacobus, J-A-C-O-B-U-S, if you're familiar um, with that. Just uh, the other day, I was flipping through a 2020 issue of the um, register of the New England Historic Genealogical Society's periodical. And I found a reviewer referring to the Jacobus Revolution. Um, mm in the 1920s and 30s, by which he meant professionalism. So professionalism, um, their big for, foremost uh, sort of value is accuracy. And I mean, it's not very controversial, but like I say, they stick to the original records. They really distrust secondary sources or you know, fa published family genealogies for the most part, published work already um, in modern times because it can replicate mistakes and, you know, basically, focus on the descendant, which is not what they want to do. They want us to think about history for its own sake and empathize, uh, you might say, in a big way with past generations, whether it violates our current values as descendants or not. All right. So um, this is what anti-commercialism looks like and professionals keep doing outcries like the heraldry reform is a big value of theirs. Like for them, it's not impossible to have an American with royals in their ancestry, but um, what they're calling for is proof, not the kind of family tree that goes back. And this is not a joke. I've seen it myself too. Um, I believe Odin is some kind of Viking god. <laughs> and Odin, uh, O D O D I N, I believe is the English spelling, and can end up at the kind of top or bottom of quite a few family trees that are more sort of um, fantastical. So, anyhow, commercialized genealogy, the descendant is the customer who must be pleased. And you're a good business person in doing that. Um, anti commercial genealogy. You know, you and the professional genealogist you work with, or maybe that's you, um, you're there to learn about history. So, um, and there's some gray areas in between, but yeah. Well, absolutely. I, I know that the uh, uh, anti-commercial, quote unquote, professionalized genealogy, there's associations, there's, you know, there's yes. certification, you know, that sort oh, yes. of thing. And, and they are, yeah, there are definitely some tensions, right, between absolutely. them and, and this yeah, this this genealogy for for um, that, that's focused on on the descendants' kind of emotional satisfaction. That's um, right. And a, a professionals, another thing they're about is uh, that that they say, and past and present is genealogy cannot be self taught, right? They specialize in advice books. They specialize in instructions how to, not for the beginner necessarily, but for the genealogist who's already been doing it, right? We have to reform the practice in the direction of sticking to the records. Um, oh yes, and there's truth to be found out there in the archive, in the printed archive, there is no doubt. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, they knew, uh, and this is generally true of genealogy, that the, um, the people who sort of come and go as hobbyists 
within the history of genealogy who kind of do it and then move on to something else. And it's very much of a side interest or it's something you do in your leisure time. They know there's that whole world out there, right? And that's who they're trying to reach and they keep on being frustrated. And this this um, <laughs> this is still going on, of course. I have to say the same old things about heraldry and stuff to this day. Um, yeah, the story doesn't end so far. <laughs> Very, very true. Very true. Very true. Well, I want to um, ask you about something else that's definitely a through line in, in your book, and you just uh, kind of introduced it by when you mentioned Everton, and, the, uh, and that's the, uh, the Mormon Church. Uh, and your book, as you state, is the, the first to bring together the history of Mormon genealogy uh, with histories of non-Mormon genealogy to kind of situate them side by side. So help us understand what, what distinguishes Mormon from non-Mormon, non-Mormon forms of genealogy. Okay, I'm going to give you as quick an overview as I can. Pardon me. <clears throat> and throughout um, the decades, I'm going to mention I um, very much researched whatever the uh, Church of Latter -day, of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints was prescribing, and I also did what I could to reconstruct the views of lay people, which sometimes would follow church prescriptions and sometimes not. Okay, so the commitment, the the spiritual and religious commitment to the dead is characteristic of Mormonism from very early days, multiple uh, declarations and revelations from the church's founder, Joseph Smith, uh, at the time that he lived. Um, and so between the roughly 1830s and 1890s, um, you have uh, development and elaboration of an important ritual. Uh, they use the word ordinance called uh, baptism for the dead, where a living person stands in um, or you know, represents a person who has died, typically from their family, not always in these decades, but I would say most of the time uh, from their family. And the idea here is uh, to approach the dead person where they are in the afterlife uh, with the gospel, they say. Uh, with the opportunity to convert to Mormonism. Now, there is no claim here to know uh, the response of the dead person or whether they indeed were in the afterlife, whether they do convert. There's nothing like this. They're not spiritualists. Um, however, it's incumbent upon the living to approach the dead in this way. Um, this is part of a uh, you know, process that has many parts of uh, you know, getting to heaven, and then there are many layers of, of heaven uh, to talk about. Well, what changes in the 1890s is that the church, uh, exactly simultaneously as it um, gives up polygamy and repudiates polygamy, that would be, be plural marriage and plural wives, at the very same time, it develops, starts to develop its genealogical apparatus. We have an internal genealogical society developed by people who know full well about the scene of, sorry, the genealogy cultures that have been in development in other parts of the country uh, in New England since the 1840s. They know all about it. They go to New England on their own roots trips. They're inspired by that. They develop these institutions in Utah and embedded within that is an especially active um, culture of teaching beginners developed by women, in particular by this one uh, leading woman who is a daughter of Brigham Young, a uh, second church president. This would be Susa Young Gates, who publishes the first ever manual, really for beginners. She really does take beginners into account. This was not an effort at reform. Um, and so it, it, it goes on from there. And in my book, I track the church's commitment to genealogy through all its phases as the gospel of the dead became all the more important. Um, and I can talk a little more about that. We go from the what's called the Temple Index Bureau from the 1920s, which is uh, you know millions of index cards transcribed by uh, workers who are mostly uh, women uh, typing away. Um, containing, um, oh, excuse me, for this uh, baptism for the dead ri uh, ritual or ordinance that's done in temples. You, uh, uh, pardon me, I should mention this before. You need the birth and the death, the birth date and the death date, and as much 
genealogical data on the dead person that you are uh, baptizing um, that you can get hold of. So to your typical card in the temple index uh, has that information, the birth date, the death date, the places, the marriages, and also the temple work that has been done by, by the person's descendants, right? It, it should show on this card whether the person has already been baptized while dead or not. So we go from um, this uh, huge amount of index cards to uh, moving the information onto microfilm and continuing to add to it. And I can go on and on into the era of the um, internet and the um, place where the microfilm negatives are stored in the side of a canyon, but um, you can read about it in, in my book to be sure. So um, over time, um, there's, it's, you know, uh, among all the other very important changes in, in Mormonism, there's no doubt that the church's commitment to the dead expressed in this explicit commitment to fostering more genealogy among more people and reaching new audiences all the time uh, becomes more and more important theologically. And what does this have to do with the rest of um, American history when it comes to genealogy? Well, starting in the 1940s, instead of Mormon missionaries going east and you know diving into the genealogy cultures there in the eastern cities and then to the Newberry Library and places like it, uh, you still have that. But uh, you're, in the 1940s, um, when the church opens up its uh, collections in a new way, you start to have people coming west, people going behind the mountain curtain as, um, as a scholar Janet Ships who first used that metaphor for non-Mormons going to uh, the Mormon um, heartland, you know. So um, we have more and more genealogy tourism and travel and pilgrimage to talk about, including um, by groups. Um, I do a lot with American Jewish genealogy in the book. And one thing I really noticed in the 1980s, and this is just an example of one group, repeated trips organized by the major Jewish genealogy journal uh, to go out to Utah and mine all those um, sources in the uh, church's International Genealogy Index uh, for whatever they can get of forebears in Europe and also uh, in the Americas. So I'll stop there. Well, that's a lot. There's, I mean, it's a long, rich history and it is, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted you mentioned Susie Young Gates. One of the great things you do in your book is personalize this history, and uh, and, and she's absolutely fascinating. And I think the, her story and and her history of, of, of rising to the 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 uh, position that she did in the church, and then uh, uh, really kind of illustrates some of the gendering that happened in genealogy as well. Um, where it was uh, women's work uh, for a long time until, at least in the, the church's case, there were other overriding church interests to, That's to yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, to this day, uh, the priesthood um, and within Mormonism, that's a very broad, broad, broad term. Uh, pretty much any right thinking, right acting man or boy who's older than 12 can become some other kind of priest. So, um, around about the 1920s and 30s, as Susie Young Gates started to age, um, genealogy instruction gradually becomes something done by and for the priesthood. And people like Susie Young Gates were perfectly free to instruct other women, but it's more controversial when they instruct men and the kinds of people doing priesthood instruction um, who are priests themselves uh, had to be men. So we do have this transition as genealogy becomes more uh, important to the church, it becomes, uh, you know, there's this new eagerness to reach male audiences and uh, obviously uh, reaching the priesthood and making it all part um, of, of the process. And I can go, go ahead, Matt, I'm ready. I can. No, I, I was just thinking what. It, talk on it <laughs> I was just thinking uh, what, a, what a wonderful illustration of the value of situating the, the history of genealogy at large um, alongside the history of Mormon genealogy, right? Because that gendering that we're talking about uh, existed as you just described in the church, but we see we see evidence of that through in, in the larger, larger genealogical landscape around Absolutely. the same time as well. So, so 
read and the book throughout, throughout time. Yes. And through well, and throughout time, of course. Time but, yeah. but absolutely. But uh, uh, in fact, in the Newberry's history, the, the early curators were all women. Uh, yeah. Curators of genealogy were all women. So, um, so a little, a little, little bit of an interesting, uh, a lot of interesting things there. So. Um, so I want to shift gears again and, and just make sure we have time to fit this in. And this is a little bit of a, a self-interested question, maybe, but I hope the audience would be interested. Uh, we know, and you state in the book, that you did a fair amount of uh, your research for the book at the Newberry. Uh, you've been a Newberry scholar and resident here for, for, for many years. So I'm just curious, do you, do you have any great research finds or can you tell any good research stories about, um, about discoveries in our, our collection here? Uh, absolutely. Well, you all have, uh, first off, full runs of periodicals that exist only on paper uh, and typically uh, do not have indexes. And I'm a lucky person. I had time mm -hmm. to browse them. So I browsed all the uh, years, uh, 70 plus of the genealogical helper. Uh, yeah, you, you, you all have that. Um, that would be the periodical run by the Everton family. Um, you know, unprecedented, a, a, a genealogy business of unprecedented size done out of, I would say, a Mormon commitment out of Utah. So you have that. Um, you also had full runs of the two major Jewish genealogy, period, genea sorry, two major Jewish genealogy periodicals of the United States so far. Um, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this uh, name and I apologize, Toledot. Um, which I understand is Hebrew for descendants, um, marked the beginning of um, institutional commitments to American Jewish genealogy. It, you know, it, 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 it was part of the uh, scenario where right after Roots and the, the founders of these Jewish genealogy societies invoked Roots directly uh, uh, when they were talking about their reason for being. Anyhow, so you've got that early periodical and you've got Abu Tenu, uh, later, which is still going uh, from the 1980s onwards. So I looked at full sets. Um, you have some wonderful holdings for indigenous genealogy, uh, Native Americans doing genealogy. And I talk uh, 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 in the book, and th this is part of a much broader phenomenon, much more work needs to be done. I've only scratched the surface really in so many ways with uh, what is it, 500, more than 500 tribes uh, acknowledged these days. Okay. Uh, point being, um, the Newberry has a very rare periodical started in the uh, around 1980 by a man in Oklahoma, Larry Sullivan Watson, whose big interest was in the five tribes. Back then, he you know he made reference to the five civilized tribes. That would be the Cherokee, the Choctaw, Creek, uh, dear me, um, Seminole. I'm blanking on the fifth one, um, but the journal is called the Journal of American Indian Family Research, and you browse it and you learn all about the, not just the emerging commitments, but all the layers of uh, indigenous people's genealogy practice uh, through book reviews and things. Uh, Larry uh, Watson, and I was never, he never identified his own tribe. I have no idea about his own indigenous self-identification if he had one, but he was all about uh, mining the National Archives in particular and archives of any sort for information about Native Americans. And there's this broader history of these tribal roles that were developed around the time of the Dawes Act, which, sorry, uh, in a sentence was all about uh, a punishing form of assimilation and those boarding schools you've probably heard about. But another thing happened with the Dawes Act was these land records, these allotment records containing the names of individual families. Well, there's this broader picture of indigenous genealogists in the 1970s and 80s and beyond taking these records and using them as evidence for their own family research. So I'm learning all about that through the Newberry. And then the, um, there's things in your special collections that I also went to. Um, uh, in the 1980s, like Matt mentioned, um, you had particular librarians here. Um, I don't have to remind you that Chicago's a segregated city and I come from another one, Boston. I'm not here to single out Chicago, but you know, um, there was this real awareness of trying to expand um, African-American uh, use of the Newberry Library and reaching out to the community of African-American genealogists uh, generally 
um, within Chicago and elsewhere. So the library went about collecting particular microfilms, um, including of the US uh, Freedmen's Bureau um, right after the Civil War and other things that were heavily used by African-American genealogists. Uh, so that, you know, the, this one, later wrote a how-to guide for African-American genealogy um, went out obtaining this grant money and they hired the um, woman uh, and um, herself was a published African-American she published for African-American um, uh, genealogists. I'm sorry if you can't hear me, I'm getting a note that my internet connection is a little weird. Um, I can say more later, but um, anyhow, yeah, there's this point in history where the Newberry's very much uh, looking for um, new audiences and meeting them where they are. So those are some of the highlights. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's that's um, wonderful to, to uh to hear, of course, it's something we can continue to try to grow and to, to build our collections on. And um, absolutely, I'm glad you've been able to make really good use of it and hope more people do, of course. So that's that's fantastic. Um, so let's, we got a few more minutes before the, the Q&A. So let's get to the uh, uh, the uh, topic du jour on many genealogists and, and the general public's mind as well. And that is DNA testing. And I'm wondering if you can tell us some of the benefits of DNA testing and analysis uh, and maybe some of the harms of DNA testing and analysis uh, to the field of genealogy. and Murray have the emergence of, um, sorry, the uses of DNA analysis for genealogy. Um, so it's all in the last 20 years. And um, to make a long story short, um, DNA uh, research of the the kind of thing that you get nowadays when you take a DNA test and you get those percentages back. DNA testing of that sort and then the other kind that we associate often with paternity where close relatives, uh, you know, people sort of test each other and then this uh, as individuals to get a sense of biological relatedness between individuals. So you have you, both these kinds and both these kinds are very important for particular forms of genealogy where the paper trail has ended or there's gaps in documentation. Now I know um, that's the case with almost all genealogists they bump into the end of a paper trail even um, within demographics that are well-documented. Well, um, for African-Americans uh, generally, um, when Alex Haley made that claim about Kunti Kente, his ancestor seven generations back who had known Africa, um, it was considered nearly impossible at that time to fully document through births and marriages and all sorts of things. Uh, uh, all those decades, through all those decades of slavery, uh, enslavement. And I talk more about that in my book, why that's the case. But um, even to this day, in modern times, African-Americans refer to the 1870 federal census, which is the earliest federal census done after slavery was outlawed as the brick wall, because it's so hard to document back of there. Um, if you have enslaved people in your ancestry, and even if you have free uh, blacks, non-enslaved people in your ancestry. Um, so DNA evidence is important for groups of people who have, I would say, particular historical reasons why um, in this broad way they're excluded from the archive. You know what I mean? Documentation is itself political. It expresses group hierarchies if your ancestor was documented and if you yourself can uh, document things, if you're in a position to do that. Um, DNA testing also gets, uh, and from very early times, 2002, I found articles in Avutenu, uh, the Jewish genealogy journal in the United States, discussing the usefulness of genia of DNA testing um, for these situations where there's document destruction and the village uh, being in three different countries within 50 years, even though the village doesn't move. Okay, the harms of DNA testing, what could they be? Uh, what could be wrong? Well, one thing I'm just um, really broadly concerned about is that um, 
people who already believed that biological relatedness was the most legitimate form of a family tie. Um, people who already have these settled beliefs about group identity, um, even though the, sci the DNA science makes nonsense of these various kinds of group identities among humans. And I'm thinking about races, I'm thinking about continents, I'm thinking about ethnicity in particular. Um, even though the science makes nonsense out of them, there's just no doubt according to these various sociological surveys that have been done in the past few years that for many people, DNA testing uh, reinforces uh, group identity, including that of race in this very indelible way. You know, we're talking about a characteristic of the body, whatever is in your DNA that gets read in a lab and compared to an unspecified uh, population. So it's a uh, bodily type thing that you can't really undo. So I end the book on a somewhat pessimistic note, but I want my book to be the beginning of a conversation, not to be the last word. So I'm looking for eventually someone to revise what I say in a more optimistic direction. And um, there's more to say about both benefits and harms. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you also uh, bring in, uh, in your book, uh, recent LGBTQ plus history. And I'm just uh, curious, can you describe further the meanings of, of genealogy in that history and, and your characterization of uh, particular forms of family building as queer? Well, there's a, a wonderful anthropological study of 1980 San Francisco called Families We Choose. Um, the author is Kath Weston. I have not looked up where she is now, but you know she's a working anthropologist with an academic post. And the reason why I'm discussing this book is that uh, within this, okay, when, when I talk about queer history, I talk about um, people who uh, declare themselves family. We are family in disregard of blood and biological ties that are so incredibly important and getting all the more important and valued among uh, people who did, did not um, identify as queer. And there's a whole range within this. You know, I have particular individuals who simultaneously um, identify as gay or lesbian who place great value also and their blood relatives. But um, Kath Weston in particular researched these webs in San Francisco that weren't always based on uh, couples, you know, uh, a lot of times it was you know, ex-boyfriends or exes, you know, at the center of them, but people who acted as family to each other. And so to this day, um, we have what's called the found family, which, uh, people may create these family bonds online, um, as well as uh, in person, again, in disregard of ties of biology and blood. And we have these particular uh, sort of declarations, I would say liberationist uh, statements about kind of getting away um, from this sort of bind of uh, biology. And so that's what I see when I see queer genealogy and I've got, uh, there, there are various kinds of uh, queer studies um, uh, sources that would uh, back up this view. Um, and when I was researching this project, I met someone in their twenties who had um, met online um, a 17 year old person who had been kicked out of their house by their parents specifically for being LGBTQ. And so uh, this person in their twenties adopted um, this teenager and uh, very much considered uh, those two people very much considered themselves a found family. And that's the first place I heard of the found families happening online, you know? So uh, this is a developing story. It's just, yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. And it brings to mind someone else you've, uh, someone else's story you tell in the book who she, she was queer, although I don't know if that was the word she would have used. Um, but uh, could you spend a minute uh, just telling us a little bit about uh, Polly Murray 
Absolutely. and why you why you tell her story and what what what's her connection here. Yes, there's some wonderful biographies of Polly Murray that have uh, just come out, and indeed she's um, embraced as an example of someone uh, gender queer in history by modern day scholars in um, queer studies. Uh, why is that? It's uh, because she was bo born with the name Anna Pauline Murray, but she took on the name Pauli, P-A-U-L-I, um, as, as an adult and here and there um, traveled openly uh, wearing a men's uh, suiting, if you will. You know, she, she reached uh, out, uh, sort of explored changing to a man, um, but then for various reasons backed away from it. And she was incredibly alone in this process. And we've, uh, there's surviving correspondence from young Polly Murray um, all about this and her biographers have done a great job with this part of her life. Well, I'm talking and, uh, she has tremendous significance to the history of feminism, what we might call the second wave um, and uh, so forth. And also to civil rights, there's particular things that she did with the 14th amendment that mattered to the NAACP lawyers arguing Brown v. Board of Education. So there's a lot of other things to say, but what I say about Polly Murray is that in the 1950s when she was middle-aged and back to being she and you know, dressing as a woman and so forth, um, she published uh, Proud Shoes, uh, among her many books, and Proud Shoes was, I would say, roots before roots. Uh, like Alex Haley's story of Kunti Kente, we're talking about a family tree of many generations reaching back to enslaved people and reaching back to free Blacks who lived in the 18th and 19th centuries, in the, um, mostly in Pennsylvania and Delaware, also free people of, of color. Um, and, um, you know, tracking this uh, family history uh, all the way down uh, to the present. So Proud Shoes was published in 1956. And I argue that it's an important and often an acknowledged, excuse me, unacknowledged antecedent um, for Roots, even though Polly Murray and Alex Haley had very different purposes and were reaching for different audiences and, and, and so forth. So it's a real milestone in African-American genealogy and in her practice of genealogy, she anticipates a lot of things to come. Uh, she helps prepare the ground on which uh, Alex Haley, um, you know, came up with his um, own uh, research on Kunti Kinte uh, those years later. And um, for, the, for those of you who, are, who don't know, um, she lived in a relatively closeted, uh, well, quiet uh, relationship with another woman and they stayed together uh, until her partner died. But this would be in the 1950s, 60s and her partner died in 1973. So uh, quite early times for a uh, same gender couple, so. Yeah, and I would just just a little plug here, let folks know we have proud shoes here in the collection uh, yeah. at the Newberry, so so come check it out. And uh, well, thank you, Francesca, and, and let's uh, make sure we have some time for Q&A. So I'm gonna turn here uh, to some of the uh, questions that were, uh, were submitted. So I, this is a little bit of a long one, but I'm gonna read this. Um, Milan Kundera, in his unbearable lightness of being, talks about the role of nostalgia, which makes even the most heinous acts lose their sting if committed long ago enough. He uses the example of Robespierre returning every 30 years to chop off more heads. Instead of chuckling about that rascal, we would be horrified. My question, why do people become so invested in sanitizing their ancient family history via genealogy, even to the extent of erasing or ignoring very old transgressions? Right. Um, well, the way I'd answer your question is to point to the more commercialized forms of genealogy that I would say, um, put it this way, are a lot easier to find, a lot, lot easier to find, especially for the casual hobbyist or the person who steps in and out or who does it sort of at home or, or on the side. Um, the way the professionals operate, the anti-commercial, which they, they really, the professionals make a point, like I say, of not apologizing for finding the rotten apples in your family tree. You kind of have to know um, 
what you're looking for. It's like the the club that doesn't have a sign outside that you kind of, you know, know that you, you know it if you know the people. Um, I can give you some uh, names and journals for this more unvarnished approach where um, people make a point of taking what there is from the past. Donald Jacobus uh, for himself talked about axe murders, ha axe murders happening between this one brother and sister in a white family of colonial Connecticut that eugenics advocates at the time treasured. This is in the 1920s. So axe murder, you know, not quite <laughs> Robespierre or exaggerations of Robespierre, but you get the picture. So um, I know exactly why this happens, frankly. Um, and, uh, nostalgia is, of course, views of the past done for the uh, priorities and the usefulness to present generations. So, of course, it's processed. Historians, uh, on the other hand, they strive as much as they can for, and I'm going to use a buzzword for my own profession, empathy. Trying to get the perspective of mm -hmm. history where you not only don't know what's happening next, but uh, you get everything. So um, all I can tell the questioner is strive. And if you email me, I can give you some uh, names and links for, uh, I would call them professionals of the more unvarnished kind of genealogy practice, if that's something you're looking for. Right, I agree. And and I would say, I would posit that the Newberry could help in that regard as well. Absolutely, so, yeah. Yeah, that. yeah, I, so. I should so, have had you address the question. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, your, your answer is fantastic. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, here's, here's a follow-up question. You mentioned the novel, Families We Choose, in reference to families formed between LGBTQ plus individuals. But is there anything you can elaborate on in regards to families formed by adoption and their genealogy? Of course, I, I must uh, clarify that Families We Choose is a nonfiction work. Um, it, again, it's an anthropological study. Um, but uh, uh, more to your question, yes, this um, we live in a we, we just got out of many decades of adoptions being conducted among strangers with the use of paid adoption agencies, often but not always, entailing. Um, destruction or concealment or alteration of the original birth certificate of the adopted baby. Um, this all got going around World War II. It was not the case in earlier American history so much where adoptions were informal and done among people who knew each other or even family to each other, kids going to live with their grandparents and stuff like that. Um, okay, my point being, um, from the 1940s, 50s, 60s, where you had these closed adoptions, the, the children, uh, the adult children, um, many of them started protesting and mobilizing and adoptee organizations. And they're very much part of genealogy because for these particular uh, reasons having to do with document destruction at a time where the birth certificate in particular acquires all the more importance you can imagine what that means in this modern times of real ID. Um, yeah, um, these people I'm going to call adoptees, adult adoptees, um, they're protesting uh, 40 years ago and, and now. And uh, this conversation goes on and it's a really important moment in the history of genealogy because um, a lot of these adoptee organizations, they, because they live without or they, 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 they perceive themselves to lack this kind of knowledge in particular of their biological relations or their genetic relations. And I don't need to tell you about the rise of uh, you know, genetics importance to medicine and things like that. The, the, there's that kind of information they lack. So they've done a lot to affirm what I see as a real American predilection to value in particular blood forms of relatedness and biological relatedness because um, I'm not adopted myself, but I would imagine if I were, I'd be surrounded all the time by reminders of why uh, I should care about genetics. You know, of course, these reality shows and things about uh, um, genealogy. So that's a short answer I would give. I do quite a bit with um, adoption in the final chapters of, of my book. 
and I'll just offer, I'll just say too that it's very very much the case that adoption research is part of a part of genealogy and family history questing. We we field many many questions from uh, not just adoptees but also also birth parents searching for for uh, searching for their children uh, here. And so it's yeah it's 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 very much tied in with with everything that you've said here. So here's a question that I, I warrant has uh, uh, may may be asked by a, a current genealogy practitioner, uh, but I will I'll go ahead and read this here. It's has Dr. Morgan researched her own family genealogy, yeah. and if so, how many generations has she found? Oh, sweet. Okay, if you're <laughs> if you're ready for this, um, I have not personally done research because my mother. Um, Frankly, um, she she passed away just a few months ago, but oh, which is sorry. simultaneously a oh, thank you, a published historian, an amazing artist, I must say, and um, a very active genealogist for decades. And she documented us to a T. Uh, she documented us very carefully. She got us back to 16th century England on both sides of the family. There's a particular point, uh, I believe, during Henry VIII's reign where. Um, the Church of England orders parishes to keep, you know, start keeping more systematic records of baptism and things like this. And so um, she got us back there and she got us, uh, she bridged all the links through early colonial, a couple of, um, uh, at least one Mayflower passenger to, uh, to talk about. Um, and um, I, I could uh, name check some revolutionary figures as well. So I joke with my students, I've got ancestors on both sides of the American Revolution. I've got ancestors on both sides of the Civil War. No wonder I'm indecisive. So <laughs> yeah, and if you look at my, um, I, I, I made a little mistake referring to our Y chromosome test my introduction, it'll be corrected in the second run of the book. But however, my point being, I put my own pie chart in there when I got a, um, DNA test done. I did it on a lark when ancestry.com was having a sale uh, in 2017. And um, this particular test of my DNA showed me 91% uh, English and Welsh. But then uh, a few years later, I got an email from ancestry saying that a greater fraction of Irishness had been found. Oh. So, yes. So, um, yeah, there's a little slice of, um, you know, the suggestions from my DNA test combined with all the documentation that my mother and people further back in my family have done. Fantastic. Did those results mostly corroborate what you expected? Yes. I was a little surprised at the Irishness, but I, I'm, I assume there's a long history of um I, even before the Scots-Irish and the colonization, but, you know, Irish making their way to uh, England and Wales um, and uh, intermarrying further back. But um, I do more modern history than I do um, early modern. So I'll have to sort of leave it there about why. Um, Irishness is one thing I didn't hear much from her except for Scots-Irish in the United States who are sort of ethnically Scottish and, mm -hmm. you know, obviously Presbyterian and whatnot, you know, kind of marrying. And um, it was that, those kinds of Irish I was aware of, not the, uh, the sort of ethnically Irish. That's a long story. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's never a short answer to a question. When Absolutely. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I, well, I dedicate this book to my mother uh, and her memory uh, for a reason. So. And I dedicated it to her before um, she passed. She had a nice long life. She was eighty-one. Well, it's it, she. She clearly, she clearly gave you a lot, and and that's a lovely sentiment. And I think we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, but thank you so much, Francesca, for sharing so much for a wonderful uh, conversation uh, this evening. Your book is a a welcome and major contribution to the field. Uh, it's a delight to lead, delight to read, and and even more fun to to get to discuss it with you. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. A uh, recording of this program is available on the Newberry's YouTube channel and Facebook page. In December 2020, our community contributed a record total to the annual fund. To meet our vital fundraising goal and set a new record in 2021, we are aiming to raise $250,000 by December 31st. We appreciate your support that make free programs like this possible. Please support the Newberry Library by making a gift today.
You can do so online at newberry.org slash give. Please join us for our next in-person program, Journalism and Police Accountability, on Wednesday, January 19th at 6 o'clock p.m. Central Time here at the Newberry. This program supports the exhibition, The Chicago Reader at 50, a half century of revolutionary storytelling, currently on view at the library through January 21st. Join our mailing list to be the first to hear about upcoming programs and other Newberry news. Sign up at newberry.org. Thank you.